Warm greetings. Today's chalk talk is going to cover hepatobiliary cystic lesions. It's not meant to be comprehensive. We'll give you an overview of certain entities that we can come across from time to time and talk a little bit about some of the features that uh, we need to know about. First, we'll talk. start off with simple cysts. You know, we see them all the time. The epidemiological studies would suggest about 15% of our patients, but really in adults, we see it more often than that, I would imagine. Um, more often seen in females, but can be seen in males, and they're almost always incidental, occasionally presenting with pain, particularly if they're near the capsule where they can stretch it, and rarely they can get super infected and cause some pain. And they're pretty uh, well circumscribed, uh, often uniloculated, have features of simple cysts, such as simple fluid on all imaging modalities. And on occasion, you may see some hemorrhagic or proteinaceous debris. That just can be called a hemorrhagic and proteinaceous cyst on uh, CT imaging. Um, that can appear a little bit more hyperdense within the fluid uh, containing cyst on MR imaging. It'll be T1 hyperintense and T2 hypointense. Internally, of course, no enhancement whether it's simple or a complex cyst. Here, another cystic lesions. We see multiple of them, variable size, scattered throughout the liver. Um, so when you see something like this, and you see numerous cysts, typically more than about 10 or 20, so somewhere in that range. Um, and as mentioned, they're of variable size and variable appearance in that some can be simple, some can be more complex with internal hemorrhagic and proteinaceous debris. Now, one of the things you need to think about is this uh, relatively uncommon entity of autosomal dominant polycystic liver disease. It's something that's unique from autosomal dominant uh, polycystic renal disease, kidney disease, where you just get these, uh, in this instance, get these multiple cysts seen uh, within the liver of variable size and appearance. Uh, it can be incidental in that uh, you image these patients and you end up seeing all these different cysts. But because of uh, the sheer number of cysts and uh, you know they can result in pain um, due to stretching of the liver capsule, they can get super infected. On occasion, the cysts can rupture, in which case you may need to resect it or undergo marsupialization. Here we're seeing multiple uh, smaller cysts. They're all about the same size and they're scattered again throughout the liver and we see numerous of them. So when you see something like that, really tiny cysts um, of a very small size, you know, um, if you you know look at all these cysts, they're certainly less than a centimeter. But if you measure them, probably less than a 1.5 centimeters, and all around that same size. And in fact, if you were to image this on ultrasound, the cysts are so small that you hardly see the fluid components, and they really look at like echogenic lesions, which is the cyst walls adjacent to one another. But one of the entities that uh, you think about is biliary hematomas, and these are also known as von Meinberg complexes. Uh, it's just something to sort of keep in the back of your mind when you see this. These are uh, often incidental. We often don't see them as well on CT, um, but can be picked up on ultrasound and uh, in particular on MR and T2-weighted sequences. It's a benign thing. You don't really need to do anything about it. And uh, one of the things, you know, to differentiate from autosomal dominant polycystic liver disease is just the size of the cyst. So well, with the autosomal dominant liver disease, uh, variable size, um, scattered throughout the liver, biliary hematomas, all really, really small in size, all typically less than 1.5 centimeters. For this next entity, I'm going to draw in the portal vein over here. As can be seen in this drawing, we're starting to see multiple small cysts that are on both sides of the portal vein. And they're somewhat clustered along the central portion of the liver. When you see this, one of the things you need to think about is peribiliary cysts. Now, these are just cystic dilatation associated with ducts, um, associated with the bile ducts, but they're these little glands that dilate. It's a benign entity and it is almost always seen in patients with cirrhosis or potentially autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease. And one of the important things to know about this is that if you don't know about this entity, it can mimic biliary ductal dilatation. However, how do you differentiate it? Ductal dilatation is on one side of the portal vein and it's tubular in appearance, whereas this, if you look at it closely, is a cluster of cysts right adjacent to each other on both sides of the portal vein. Here we have an isolated cyst in uh, uh, the left hepatic lobe, specifically um, somewhat subcapsular location and uh, in segment four. And when you see this entity of this uh, you know, isolated cyst, subcapsular, segment four, one of the things that you need to think about is this really, really uncommon entity um, called ciliated hepatic foregut cyst. Most often it's seen in middle-aged adults, uh, more often in males and females, though of course it can be seen in females as well. It's a congenital lesion and it almost always is incidental but because of that subcapsular location it can stretch the capsule a little bit 
and uh, cause some pain or discomfort in the right upper quadrant. So patients may on occasion can present with those symptoms. Importantly, this does have malignant potential. Can undergo transformation to squamous cell cancer. It's exceedingly rare. I mean, there are case reports, but it has been reported. And uh, as a result, if you are suspecting this, you, know, you may want to sample it. If it comes back as ciliated hepatic foregut cyst, um, patients should undergo resection. Another lesion we can see uncommonly within the liver manifest typically as a large cyst, isolated, can be anywhere within the liver, so there's no predilection to one segment or one hepatic lobe. Demographically, and this is important, it's most often seen in middle-aged females or a little older-aged females. It can be simple, it can be complex in that it has internal debris, it can have variable wall thickness. Internally, it may contain some septations as well. And so if you see this sort of mass isolated in a middle-aged or older-aged female, you want to think about the possibility that this represents a hepatic mucinous cystic neoplasm. Now, if that term is somewhat unfamiliar, you may be more familiar with what it was previously known as a biliary cyst adenoma, but the nomenclature has changed. So now it's known as a hepatic mucinous cystic neoplasm. As mentioned, it's uncommon like a lot of these liver cysts, it's most often seen as an incidental finding, but this can present with pain, some discomfort, and reports of early satiety, particularly if it gets large and starts compressing upon uh, the stomach. Now, you may also on occasion see a mass like this, but in addition to all these features, it has these internal soft tissue nodules. Now, when you see that, it's really, really uncommon, but the entity you need to think about is the invasive version of this hepatic mucinous cystic neoplasm. And of course, this was previously known as biliary cystadenocarcinoma. So a lot of these things are difficult to call prospectively, but it's something you can bring up in your differential um, when you see the right lesion in the right patient demographics. Either of these entities, you really want to advocate resection if that's uh, what's proven to be when you sample it, or if the patient has symptoms, um, you know, this needs to be resected. The final lesion we'll cover uh, is one of the more common lesions. It's not a neoplasm per se, but it manifests as a thick enhancing mass, as can be seen by this uh, sort of gray circle with peripheral edema and uh, hyperemia. And internally, the cystic lesion looks quite complex with heterogeneity on T2-weighted images. The wall is thick, it's enhancing. As I said, there's surrounding edema and hyperemia. When you see that, you've got to think of the possibility that this reflects an abscess. Now, abscesses come in a variety of flavors. You can have most commonly pyogenic abscesses. You can also have fungal abscesses that tend to be smaller in size. And then another entity is, uh, another type of abscess is, of course, the echinococcal abscess. Not very common in our patient population, but certainly if someone has traveled um, to an area where this is endemic um, and comes back here, this is something that uh, we can encounter from time to time. And this has a somewhat unique appearance, depending on the stage of disease, but the classic appearance is you'll see a relatively large cystic mass, and internally will have these daughter cysts, these little cystic lesions at the periphery of it. And so when you see these daughter cysts, uh, you know, you want to, and the patient has traveled to a lesion where this entity is endemic, you want to think of it in a cockle um, abscess. These patients typically need to get albendazole for treatment, and if they're uh, symptomatic, will have to undergo surgical resection. Because of the risk of anaphylaxis, usually premedicated uh, in advance to prevent uh, that from happening. Thank you for your attention.